All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. Super excited about today's guest. Uh, you already met on the podcast his partner, his partner, and today you'll meet the other half of Max and Patrick, which is Max. Max DeMello, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, PK. Well, I'm in his office, so it's kind of weird, but thanks for having me slash coming on the show. You know, our uh, office is your office anyways. It's it's good. There's a, there's a good vibe in here. We got the couch leaning in. Talk about some business. So um, I'm excited about today's podcast because we learned about the development side of what MP Dev does with Patrick. And, you know, a lot of the part that I'm interested to learn about today really is about building relationships. You, you know, you've done so well at building the correct relationships. Some of the deals you guys have done is just because you knew a guy that knew a guy. And I want to really hone in today on how to correctly build relationships with, without expecting anything in return um, and, and things like that. So before we begin, talk just a little bit to them about just who you are, how you got to the country, just like a few minutes, who you are, how you got into real estate, and then we'll get going. All right, sounds good. So yeah, my name is Max. Patrick and I got here about five years ago. Um, our first visit to the U.S., I think if I recall correctly, was like 2010, 2011. We just spent a couple of days here in, in Scottsdale, uh, went to Vegas and L.A. Uh, that was my first time in the U.S. Um, we enjoyed it a lot. We got to see a lot. Obviously, we partied a lot. So it was not like a primary uh, business trip at the time. <laughs> it was more like golfing and uh, going out and kind of exploring uh, those cities. And then when we came back in 2017 then, actually, let me back up. We spent six months prior to coming here, 2017. I think it was around 2015. Um, let, let's just call it an extended vacation, right? Where we came back because we enjoyed it here and we wanted to, we actually enjoyed Scottsdale the most out of those um, three cities that we went to. And we just, uh, you know, wanted to get the experience of, you know, getting to know this town and, and Arizona a little bit more. And next thing you know, we were renting... Um, a townhouse here, right on 68th and Camelbacks. So literally, you can see it from our office here. And uh, we realized that, you know, we were paying, I think it was like 2700 It was a furnished rental, two-bedroom, one-and-a-half bathrooms. And it was a community pool, uh, parking um, parking spot. Um, and you could technically walk to Old Town. So we, we realized that we were pray paying actually quite a lot because there were properties for sale around $100,000. At the time, uh, wow, crazy! But I wish. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I wish we wouldn't have sold everything that we that we did sell. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it started, and we realized that there's definitely an opportunity. I mean, it doesn't take you have to, you know, have a master's degree and and, and math to understand that there's definitely an opportunity when you look at these numbers. And that's when we started to get intrigued about real estate. And uh, we said, listen, let's just let's just go check out some some of the listings, right? So we started to talk to different agents, went to open houses, and um, I think in the span of like six months, we looked at I don't know, hundred hundred plus homes. I I mean, once we figured this out, we got signed up with pretty much every agent on all the alerts, and you know, we just kind of dug deep and and enjoyed that, and then we pulled the trigger on our first deal, which happened to have uh, been located three, four ho houses down, doors down from where we were renting. So we actually ended up buying in the community that we rented before. Um, and that's how this whole whole real estate gig started, pretty much with with literally no clue, not really a lot of money. I mean, we had 50000 yeah. each at the time. Um, and uh, and we just we just enjoyed the process from, you know, th that property, as you know, we, we remodeled it. I mean, didn't know a contract. We just... We, we literally knew nothing, but we did do our due diligence over a good amount of time and started to understand the numbers, the areas, um, and everything that was evolved around the, w how do the values look like? What can we rent it for, yep. right? So um, we just, we just got very intrigued with that. Um, and I guess when you get intrigued about something, 
and you want to get to know more, you you figure it out, and that's that's what we did. That's awesome, and because we're going to connect the dots here, but that's your first deal. So, what would you buy it for? Uh, we bought it for eighty six thousand eight hundred dollars. Eighty six eight hundred, and what's the most recent big deal that? Wh- what did you buy your most recent big deal for recently? Any time in the last few years? Um, the last deal that we bought. Um, investment property was 1.45 million. Okay. So we're going to learn how to go from 86 to 145 developing in how many years was this span? Pretty much five years in five years. So first of all, guys, if, if, if you are new to the channel, you got to click the link in the description as well as right here to watch the other podcast with his partner, Patrick, because you're going to learn a lot of the development side an aspect of of construction and contracting and today i want to talk about putting a deal together um first of all describe the relationship with you and patrick what what in your words what do you do versus what does he do to make a development company work i guess maybe to go back what we what we touched on before when we started not only we we didn't have any experience nor any big financial means backgrounds or contacts here because we're not from here but we also didn't really know who's doing what. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, then I guess you also don't know who's doing what, right? Yeah. Who doesn't know what the other person doesn't know, right? So we, so it, it just all very organically developed into where it is today, where <coughs> the actually sourcing the deals, um, whether it's on-market or off-market. As you know, we're, we're licensed agents here in Arizona and in Florida now too. So the brokerage um, community is very important, whether it's our in-house team that we have here or other agents in the community. That's a big resource. But also, you know, wherever we have the projects, whether it's neighbors or, I mean, I don't know how many times I knocked on doors, jumped out of cars to say hi to someone, and next thing you know, uh, stuff happens, right? So as long as you're, as long as you're out there, um, you'll be surprised how many how many occasions kind of come up where you can just start building a relationship or getting to know someone, right? And you never know where it leads to, right? Mm-hmm. As long as your intention is genuine, which um, that's something that we've always had. So, you know, my, my focus is more on the l- relationship side, whether it's in the agent community, sourcing the deals, uh, relationships with owners and clients, um, as well as investors. Um, I think that's a, that's a big part in our business. And we both manage those, but... You know, over the years, I think we both realized who who is better in which department, better or who enjoys it more, right? And usually, when you enjoy something more, if you're not if you're not completely off, you're actually also very good at it at some point, right? Right. Um, practice makes perfect, and I think um, that part, coupled with the with the sales process, marketing, um, and the art of putting the deal together, right, where you know you need to find a deal. You need to have the funds available, whether it's financing or cash or both. Um, you need to understand how, how those agreements are put together. So I think that, you know, those are the those are the things that, that I enjoy a lot. And that's why, you know, it, it doesn't matter day, day, night of the time, time difference, if I'm here or not here. Uh, I mean, you know that because we've been working together for a while. Um, that's what I love. And, uh, you know, I think we got pretty pretty good at it yeah and um yeah that's how it's split up and then the on-site stuff you know the day-to-day going on projects talking to superintendents um managing the actual construction um which that is part of the development side but also ties into the construction part right we're depending on the project and location sometimes we are our own builder sometimes we work with other builders but that part of the process um patrick's just gotten extremely good at um and i know he enjoys it too sometimes he doesn't when it's either fucking hot or fucking cold <laughs> on the job site um <laughs> but for the most part he en- he enjoys it too i used to do project management myself bigger projects outside of real estate so i i enjoy that part too but i also understand you know if you want to build a successful company you gotta have complementary you know relationships or partners and and i think the biggest asset that we have is the relationship that we have, not only as best friends for 15 years, but by now in our setup, we're just extremely complimentary. Right. So in, in terms of the, the day-to-day operation, you're saying that you spend 
more of your time now managing relationships, not like Patrick doesn't, but more of your time managing relationships, finding new connections, realtors, investors. Patrick is managing job site to job site, making sure deals are getting done and actually going to the finish line. That's kind of the breakdown. Yeah, now. and then and then also I think a big part is the the actual vision of what we do with a property. Um, and it's not only the concept of the numbers, right? Because obviously you gotta you gotta buy right, you gotta understand your performer, you, and you gotta c- somehow forecast an exit. And with that, you know the components of financing and cash come into play. But it's also to understand, okay, what is, what's the, how does how's the house actually gonna look like, right? And I'm not only talking about the design, but I'm talking about function functionality of the space. I'm talking about value engineering when it comes to, okay, we're doing remodels. Are we adding square footage here? Are we taking out a wall here? What are we actually doing here? And that's what Patrick, you know, is just just absolutely amazing it. And I, and I think we still we still talk about a lot of those things, um, but mostly mostly that's on him. And yeah. I think I can give give some good feedback on I- in some parts, but I also know my place, you know. Right. I just, I would never... Uh, I would never try to to get to the level that that he gets because again, it's got to be complementary if you want to grow and and execute on all levels. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit. So so starting out, you guys come about five years ago. You don't have any connections. You don't know anybody, and within five years, you have, I mean, seven or eight active projects right now going on. Right. Yeah. Um, seemingly endless connections. You could call somebody right now for basically anything of the home, get money if you needed it. So where do you start? Like, what was your first maneuver? Was it door knocking? Was it networking events? What What did you guys do to start to get your name out there? It sounds it sounds so simple, but uh, we did two things. We did everything. So you got to just try things out, right? Constantly. It's still yeah. up up until today, and um, we just worked harder than probably most most of anybody here in town, and that's still that still today preserves, I guess, a good part of the reputation that we got here, right? Because right. you got to think about this, right? If you don't, if you don't know anyone, you don't have money. Like, w- what can you really control? I mean, the only thing you can control is the work that you put in, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, resources as far as educating yourself from uh, YouTube, Google. I mean, there's so many resources that you can just educate yourself and figure it out. Paired with obviously, you know. Activities such as door knocking and flyering open houses. That's one of the big ones. And it obviously depends on which part of the business are we are we talking about, right? Are we talking about the brokerage side? Are we talking about the development side? Investors, like it's not even going to door knock an investor, right? You just got to like understand which part of the business require which activities. And that also changes as the business evolves, right? Um, I mean, I haven't, I personally haven't set an open house in a while not because I, not because I don't want to necessarily, but the, the the activities change, and also in the higher price points. If you look over five, six, seven million, which is kind of our, you know, niche, either the houses don't get to the finish line because we pre-sell pretty much everything. Right now we're at a hundred percent pre-sell rate, so there's no no way to really finish this house and set it open. And if it's a retail sale, like we we do have these two, um, the clients just don't want any open houses which i understand is privacy concerns etc right. but you know i think understanding the activities that get you the results and then literally work at work as hard as possible consistently th- i mean that's what we did yeah so it seems like to me your day to day over the years has transitioned from more i guess you call it broker related activities to now development related activities yeah we we do both. We're we're very selective on the brokerage side. Um, our clients, you know, it's a very selected group of people that we do everything for. Uh, and if it's a if it's a rental or a ten million dollar sale, we d- we treat it equally the same. Yeah. Um, so those relationships still preserve and generate a lot of referrals, which is the best best lead source that we have had pretty much after we started to get to know some people and and deliver, um, it pretty quickly turned out that referrals is just the best, you know, lead source for us and also the most reliable one and the most sustainable one, right? Because if you take care 
of your clients and your relationships and you always go above and beyond which which I know we do every single time then you know it's it's the competition doesn't uh, uh, the competition gets pretty slim out there you yeah. know um, so yeah so we still do that um, I enjoy that part um, um, more I guess than Patrick does too that's something we're you know, I would say I'm a little bit more in the lead th- than he is, which is fine. But we still, it's still a package deal, right? So whoever works with us, whether it's on a buyer or seller representation, you always have two. Mm. It's two plus we have the team and and all the other resources that um, that you are aware too. So I guess that's that's a big selling factor and like service proposition that we have. It's always you always get two. Yeah. So I want to unpack a couple deals because you're I mean the deals are so interesting I'd like to do three deals I would like to talk about your first deal I would like to talk about the deal that I'm in with you on and I'd like to talk about your 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 home because mm-hmm. I, I think we can gain value off of all, all three so let's start as let's start with the one on 68th here that's a small deal walk us through every element from how you found the money maybe use your own money the deal the whole deal I want I want to hear about the deal Okay, so it was our own money. Okay. And it was all the money that we had. <laughs> uh, no investors. I mean, obviously, I was aware of that. We we knew you could work with investors, but we didn't know how and who at the time. We were just, we knew we had the money. We wanted to do it, and that's how it started. As far as sourcing the deal, um, I think Patrick and I probably thought at the time that the real estate agent is going to do that for us. However, once you get a little bit more savvy, you realize that everything that's on the market, you can pretty much see as an end user yourself, right? I mean, there's a lot of third-party providers like Zillow, et cetera, Redfin, um, or Realtor.com where you can see um, those listings available on the market. So as you understand, the access to the information is pretty much, you know, pretty much unlimited outside of off-market deals. Um, you become a lot more knowledgeable and then you start comparing. You see what closed when, how long has it been on the market for? And that is a very, very transparent and unique kind of feature of this market. Like mm-hmm. Patrick and I in Germany, I can tell you this, you, you will most likely not know what your neighbor bought or sold for. It's a it's a pretty much a complete black box. Yeah. It's the exact opposite here. So I think that helped a lot. And then we found the deal ourselves. Like we walked around in our community and there was a sign in the window and we just called and I, I remember I called, I said, hey, I see your sign here. Are you like, uh, you want to sell? And mm-hmm. she said, yeah, you want to buy? I said, well, I think so. Maybe we should talk. So we kind of, we did the deal direct mm-hmm. out of a sign in the window. And we just saw that by walking around. And that shows again, we, you know, if we didn't really know that we we're going to buy in that particular pocket. But as we started to look more, we kind of honed it down on, two or three different parts here in Old Town that we were closely looking at. And, I mean, why n- why not walk around? Drive around, walk around. If you see someone, run into someone, just, you know, strike a conversation. It's not that difficult. So, in that case, it was a sign in the window, and then we got the deal done. So we kind of found it ourselves, although we talked to probably every agent here in town and try to get all the information out of them, which obviously now being an agent, you know, that's like the most annoying thing when <laughs> guys like us call you and call different agents and ask, f- I mean, because the world, uh, the world travels pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Like if somebody in the luxury segment, sometimes we get calls, hey, did you, did that guy call you too from California, that XYZ asking about this and that? I mean, it travels pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, then we closed on it uh, for 86800 We actually used an agent um, to represent us at the time to write up the paperwork. And then, I remember we were at the title company. We uh, signing a bunch of documents. I mean, nobody really reads most of those documents. Anyways, There's a lot let's of just be honest. documents. But I mean, don't forget, like English is Patrick's second language, my third language. I mean, I was <laughs> looking at most of the stuff. I'm like, what the fuck are we signing here? <laughs> and then we, I remember we signed it, and then we transferred the money. I'm like, oh fuck, okay. Well, now this is definitely happening. So closed on the property and then we're like okay that property just looks terrible we got to do something with it so then we had no contractors what do you do you go on google you type in contractor scottsdale 
And then I started to make phone calls. We interviewed different people. Long story short, uh, first referral we got in Scottsdale was the contract. And it was a referral from an Uber driver that we knew for two minutes. That realized that we had a little bit of an accent and we strike a convo. And he said, what are you guys doing here? I said, yeah, we're remodeling a property. And he said, yeah, you have a contract? I said, yeah, I don't know. We're like Googling away. And then he's like, let me call my buddy Robert. Next thing you know, Robert was on speaker and uh, we got connected. Turns out Robert uh, has a raggy band and that's his main gig. And then part time he remodels houses. Anyways, we clicked. We got a bid from everyone. He was the not necessarily the cheapest, but we we compared three bids, then understood the scope, looked obviously up pricing for materials, uh, which we sourced ourselves. And then we chose Robert, who actually ended up doing, I don't know, four or five deals for us. Well, and um, off an Uber referral, off an Uber referral, um, and that's why, you know, and, and in that in, in that sense, it's not like I asked the, it's not like I sat in the Uber. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna ask the guy for like a contractor referral. It's kind of random, right? Mm-hmm. But again, if you if you just strike a genuine conversation, which I think is, it's it's not that difficult, especially in this country. You know, I mean, uh, this s- small talk here uh, is pretty pretty common, right? But then to kind of get get it from a small talk to potentially something productive or more sustainable, that's just you just got to do it often enough, right? Mm-hmm. So, anyways, um, we put in, I would say about like. Anywhere between let's say like twenty five to thirty thousand, we furnished it. We replaced the floors. Um, we couldn't buy a new fridge because we ran out of money, so we kept the old fridge. Um, I remember that. Uh, then we went to IKEA. That was an absolute nightmare because there was going to be an Airbnb, so we had to. We need towels and all that stuff. I mean, I mean, we're guys. It's not like I'm a I'm a pro in the kitchen department. So we rode through IKEA, thinking that with one little cart we can like because you just go through there and it's actually oh yeah i see this so it kind of makes sense if you just follow the path all the way to the cash at some point you probably have everything that's yeah. what we thought right well it's kind of how it was but then it was four cards later <laughs> we had i mean we bought so much stuff <coughs> anyways we furnished this place and then we rented it out short term um we had a property manager in place from a referral and the referral ca- came from a from someone that we met at the W, obviously, where we w- where would we go? Drinks at the W, gym at Lifetime. That's where we met the first people here. And um, rented it out, I think, w- for about a year or two. We made some good money there, mostly mostly remote because we were not living here. And then we sold it. Uh, but I remember the all-in, if, if we would take the entire profit we made on our, I'd say, like $110,000 investment, we made about 61,000 total profit. And that is profit between net rental income and the proceeds from the sale. Yep. Because we rented it out and then we sold it. And then the lady we sold it to said, hey, you guys have been managing this. Why don't you manage this? Continue to manage it. And we said, okay, good. So we did that, made money there, then sold it again. I think just with that deal alone, I mean, we were easily made over over 100 150 thousand if i add everything together that we did mm-hmm. and and considering at the time this was an eighty six thousand dollar deal right mm-hmm. so you got to put that in in perspective and we did probably 10 plus deals in this entire community because wow. and actually i do remember we bought another one well this is credit to patrick this was a good move we wrote a handwritten note and patrick wrote it and there are in this community there's four laundry rooms okay there's about 300 units and they are like in little blocks four pools four laundry rooms and entertainment areas and the the handwritten note said you know if you're looking to sell uh, give us a call we live in the community and we own a property we're looking to buy one more Mm -hmm. and then an old lady reached out to patrick and said hey i'm renting i'm renting in this unit here um, I think my, I think the landlord wants to sell. Yeah. So anyway, so somebody actually called the older lady off this note and then we got introduced to Jim and Jim is from Canada and I don't know how many deals we did with him. It's got to be at least two, three, four. We ended up doing a couple deals with Jim from Canada. That was the landlord from the old lady that saw the handwritten note at the laundry room. And again, I can, 
you know, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but I think any possible way to get a deal from an Uber driver to door knocking to referrals to laundry rooms to notes to, I mean, Instagram. I don't think there's anything that we have. Oh, sitting next to a guy at the plane. I don't think there's anything that we haven't yeah. done yet. But it's not that whenever we meet someone, we're like, okay, how, how can we squeeze a deal out of that person? How can we make money with that relationship? It's it's never been like that. But we we meet a lot of people. We engage with a lot of people. So by default, if you put in the work, right, and you have good intentions, at some point, something is just going to come out of it. Mm-hmm. So, so that has has always worked out wha- well for us, and um, and still until today, there's probably every week at least one or two of those things where uh, when I like think about it, I'm like, dude, I can't believe it. it's just it it's always been like that for Patrick and me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that works out great. So those are the numbers for that deal. I do remember thinking about it. I was like, if this if this deal doesn't work, we're like completely fucked. <laughs> I mean, yeah. however, at the same time. You, you just got to go for it, you know? Sometimes when you work so hard, there's really not that much time to, to think about too much stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Ah, should we do it? Ah, maybe something else. If you just, it's it's almost like you get like tunnel vision. And I'm not saying that in like, a, we don't do our due diligence, right? We did our due diligence, but, you know, you just got to pull the trigger. I think there's a lot of people that we know as well, we both know that, you know, they have a lot of potential, and like uh, I think about a lot of those guys every now and then. I'm like, man, if those people would just pull the trigger a little bit more, you know, if you can't pull the trigger, you just nothing's gonna happen. You just gotta like take the risk. Yeah. Obviously, the risk becomes more calcul- calculated at some point because you have more experience, more resources, and I think we can judge better how risky something is. But at the same at the same token, you just gotta you just gotta do it. Yeah. I mean, and and we still do it every single time. Yeah, well, ta- talking about risk, the risk just, I think there's two parts. So number one is some people don't know how to even assess risk. So you say, oh, you know, it's risky or not. They don't even know where to start, which is obviously has to do with knowledge and cash. But number two, the risk just grows. Um, so, the, the you know, the, the three properties I want to talk about, the other one is the one that I'm in on. That, you know, that one's a whole different ballgame. One, what was the acquisition price on that house, Silvercrest? Um, acquisition was one five. Okay. And by the way, uh, the house we're talking about now is one that's on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, so you can see what we're talking about. So one five, under contract, going through the process. Walk me through that deal because I remember you said it was kind of difficult to get that house. Like you had to like work on that guy. It was hard to get. Like even that relationship was tough to get. So. Patrick and I never met the owner. I guess that's where it starts. Um, I've had over the span of like about nine months, I don't know how many phone calls I have with that guy, but a lot. I mean, I he was on in my follow-up uh, system, and there's not some fancy tech. This is just me making notes to call the guy over and over again. Um for a long time, and uh, he was a gentleman from California, a very sophisticated investor, multiple um, properties. Um, he's actually big in multifamily. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of other ventures, but you just know when you deal with a sophisticated guy. And he was an older gentleman, and we got his contact um, from from someone that we, that we met prior, about half a year ago, um, that lady's actually in the industry as well. She's a designer. So that's how we got connected to him. And I think the challenge there was, one, he was a little bit older, right? Which it's not like we were, like, texting back and forth. Um, so to get a hold, actually, of him on the phone was very difficult at times, right? Whether it's through his assistant or not, then he, uh, he didn't get a text or didn't get a voicemail. Like, we just had to stay on him. That was one thing. And it's h- very, very difficult to build a good relationship or report over the phone, especially with someone who's A, very experienced, B, a little older, right? I mean, I'm gonna there's only, I'm going to talk to him about how I was at the W last weekend. I'm pretty <laughs> sure pretty sure that was not the case. So, um, But f- 
for whatever reason, we kind of we, we kind of clicked. Most of the conversations were about the market and uh, about what we were doing at the time. Um, he was he asked the right questions. He wanted to know which properties we were already developing, uh, what our experience was, and I was just honest. I said, you know, this is what we have been doing. We're not from here, but um, we work pretty much twenty four seven, which. About two or three months in, he's like, okay, I know there's no time for you guys. Like early morning, uh, late night, you guys are always on. Because at times we had like calls at, at hours that would were outside of the business hours. Yeah. And he noticed that was never a problem for me and it wasn't for him. Mm -hmm. So I guess we created a relationship and sympathy over he knew I was serious. Um, and I sent him the contract to sign, man, probably 10 times. <laughs> and he never signed it. And um, honestly, I think if I, if I think back, I think Patrick and I, we also kind of forgot about the deal. Because I, I remember when we actually, when I had that call with him and he said, listen, are you still interested in buying it? He said, send me the contract. And I was on the phone with him. I had it pretty much in DocuSign already. And I just adjusted a couple of things to made it up to date. And he signed it. And I told Patrick, I said, we got the contract. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, because I remember by the reaction of Patrick, it's not like something we were like waiting to get because it didn't happen so many times. We're like, ah, you know, this is probably never going to happen. But I just, I just don't give up. Yeah. Um, you know, do I, did I know all along the way that it's going to work? You know, I mean, if you get rejected so many times, you're like, ah, you know, I don't know. Sure, definitely that was definitely going through my head, but I just don't give up. I just like I don't I don't I just mm -hmm. don't. So and most of the times it actually it actually works. So if you stay on it, stay persistent, and the guy said the reason I'm selling it to you is because I know you're serious. You know what you're doing, you know your market, you've always been polite, respectful. Everything that I said I was gonna do, I actually did. So even through the phone remote from two different states, um we got that deal done and um it was not too much for him. It was not too much for him. The price was not like the biggest thing, but I felt like I had to earn to actually buy this property from him. Mm. It was it was a very, you know, this is obviously not your regular deal. It's not your regular situation where you where you um that you encounter on the acquisition side. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the story for that one. So this wasn't a deal where he was, he never said, Hey, we get the deal done at this number. No, it was, he it always kept it up in the air. And like I said, very sophisticated guy. I never got a real answer. You know, I only got no answer. And I mean, just kind of roundabout answers the whole oh time. Oh no, he didn't. He's like, he didn't even look at the DocuSign. Oh, I see. So, but then you had to maintain that kind of fine line of, you know, I was not going to call him and say, dude, I mean, I, how many more times do you want me to send this? <laughs> you just got to, you know, you just got to know on how to navigate through that and still be polite, respectful, mm -hmm. um, and maybe leave him alone for a couple of days, right? Because um, cause that's the other thing, especially in, in the high-end um, and higher-end deals and more sophisticated buyers, whether it's on the retail side or on the investment side. There are so many deals that y we thought that were off the table, they were just maybe under the table. We just had to pull them back on the table. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of a lot of interesting dynamics, especially in the higher price points, and you just never know. Yep. So you just got to, the Keep relationship plugging. part, you just got to pl plug away, and you just got to have a good relationship with everyone. You know, not everyone's going to be your closest friend, but you just got to still do the right thing. And when you do the right thing often enough and you stay on it, stuff just happens. So what's the deal look like? So you said like one five. Um how big was it when you bought it? And I just kind of go through it, uh, even though I know the answers. Just yeah, ro roll yeah. through all the whole thing. I think something that's very worthwhile mentioning too is we actually offered the deal when once we had it on the contract. We've never done such a big deal, a big deal at the time. We offered it to two investors and they didn't want it. And I think I remember you saying that. They said, "What was their reasoning? They didn't want it." Oh, they said it's obviously the complexity of the project. I mean, we had done a similar deal, significantly smaller. In, in resale price um, in the same area, but this was a different animal. I mean, it was higher up on the mountain um, and the scope of the project and the money it takes 
and the resources. It's we just knew this was going to be the 2.0 version of what we've done before. So mm-hmm. now we're in a situation situation where we haven't again haven't done something before, but we're still doing it right. And the idea was to just sell the deal to someone. Obviously, still be involved somehow on the sales side, but um, we try to assign the assign it. But that um, and in that in, in your world, that's in, in the world of what people talk about. When you're saying assign, you're you're kind of talking about wholesaling. Well, it's pretty much in wholesaling. A, a you you just you just transfer the equitable rights. So you sell the contract to another party and you make a fee on it. Yeah. Right? And nobody picked up. Nobody. Nobody picked. No, it's we didn't push it that hard, but we had actually one one very sophisticated investor who flew out here. We had like one athlete in conversation. They're like, "Oh man, this is uh, this is a big boy." And and then we had guys in town that were actually doing. I've been in real estate for a long time. They looked at the project. Like, man, I just don't know. This is like, this is just this is just big boy leaks. And then, but everything happens for a reason, right? And if yeah. I think back, especially on that deal. Um, it's it, it definitely remains true. And then um, the property at the time there was a, there has been an, had been a tenant in there, um, so it was somewhat livable. Um, fairly high up on the mountain, unobstructed Camelback views, and you actually get a good peak of downtown as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was rented out. And then when we got in there, we're like, okay, should we remodel? Should we take the roof off? Should we add square footage? And the initial scope of the project it was going to be like a maybe like a five million dollar resale so it was not going to be this uh, nine thousand plus square feet home which it is right now it was going to be you know maybe five thousand fifty five hundred take the roof off at about two two and a half thousand square feet it was not going to be the the extent of where the project is right now so covid and all the delays and um and patrick's uh sleepless nights and vision to turn this into something bigger um, cause it to be the project that it is right now, which, oh. as you know, is our signature signature project, and um, I, I can't wait to see it complete. So at what point did you go, well, nobody's picking up this deal. we got to flip it. Like, did, Was there a, a day where something was said, or you were just like, let's do it? I mean, when they didn't take the deal, obviously we knew we had something, right? So. Yeah. The second the property's under contract, you obviously got to fulfill contract obligations, right? Opening escrow, putting in earnest money. So obviously we did everything that we said we we're going to do verbally and obviously in writing. So we weren't too upset, but then we said, oh, do we just got to put this deal together. So the main anchor investors in the deal were investors that had already invested with us on another project, mm-hmm. which we exited at just under 1.7 million. That was the whole project. Now we're talking about the acquisition being pretty much almost at the exit level from the other project. Right. Right. And again, question from those guys, have you done something like this before? We said, yeah, we have the other one that, we, that we're that we doing here that's pre-sold. Uh, but that magnitude, we haven't. It's right. Not, we simply haven't. But um, I guess the, again relationship also paired with a performance and the fact that we put a pretty um, appealing package together where we also said we're going to put in our own money, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of convinced investors to, to go with it. Then along the way, as the project got bigger, everybody realized, you know, prices are going up for construction. Um, the market is appreciating. I mean, we had a year-over-year appreciation of almost 40% in Paradise Valley. Um, delays, delays that have been causing due to COVID and we said, listen, I we just can't do what we initially thet, s- thought we were going to do as far as the project scope because we would just leave so much money on the table. Mm-hmm. And as you know, adding square footage that's the that's the name of the game, right? That's how you that's how you a create more value, a high higher resale price, and that's how you have the best downside protection for your investment because the profit yeah. margin just gets bigger. So yeah, then we uh, remember we had a call with investors and we said, ah. You know the the five million dollar exit. I don't think I think we just gotta go go big or yep. go home on this. Um, and then we obviously structured it in a certain way. We were like, okay, if we if we pre-sell this, then we don't need to raise additional money. So we created the renderings that you know of with our with our team from Europe, and and then we pre-sold it at the bigger number without any additional money. 
and uh, that's that's pretty much the deal. So interesting. That deal has how many investors in it? I'm in that one, guys. If you don't know, um, we have I think the total group is like ten ten yeah. guys, including us. So Patrick and me, we I always count as one. So it's us plus nine. Yeah, I think the outside of the house itself and the uh, the numbers, it, just watching the process is so interesting. That's what I've. It's worth it in itself, even if like, um, even if the returns weren't as astronomical as it was projected to be. It's just it's so interesting to see how a deal gets done. Yeah, you and know. you have you have your on your YouTube channel. You have a couple of cool videos. Yeah, we actually. Um, posted the Silvercrest tour as well, where you can see when you actually watch the video, and Patrick explains how the construction actually takes place, right? And I'm uh, and I'm pointing specifically towards the bedrooms that we couldn't build because we needed access for the pool, right? Mm -hmm. For the retaining wall and the pools first. Now we pretty much uh, put the foundation there, and we're building bedrooms after the fact, while everything else is kind of already framed. So there's this is not just a straightforward um, deal where you where you're like, okay, those are big numbers yeah. uh, and big profits. But what it takes, not only on the financial side, on the marketing side, but also on the construction development side to actually make that happen, um, that's, a, that's a complexity level that, um, that is definitely up there. And, and totally. we, we enjoy that because obviously you grow with that, right? You grow with these challenges. And um, going through the projects that we have right now, uh, you know, I think by now we, we feel confident pretty much taking – anything on i don't think we're we've never really been afraid or we never really had that like mm -hmm. i said you know we pull pull the trigger but you know as you know we're looking into into the florida market now we have a project there um that we're also going to take you to i don't think if we have i think we've already posted we did post the first episode of that project there yep. but you look at different markets and you know you can always you can always go bigger you can build on the water which w we are actually doing right now we're building up on the mountain here but you know, there's just so much more to explore. And I guess one thing is the price point, but also, you know, to be able to always think back and be like, yeah, we started with a $86,800 townhouse. And, um, y you know, most of the projects that we deal with right now and, and the numbers are just like, they're completely on another level. But there is also another level to that level, yeah. right? Which uh, which that's how it, how it remains exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, totally. I th in real estate, there's, just, I mean, shoot, you see some of these these tours on YouTube. There's there's another level every time. It's and then, great, and, and, and then it'll just keep pushing. And then there's a different level of that too, right? Which is that multifamily space that we just started. Um, yeah. Our first project actually refied and almost stabilized it, which is a different asset class, different investment. Not necessarily a different investor, because investors like to diversify, as we all know, including ourselves. So being able to kind of have a diversified setup where the luxury development side is one side, but you also have a more like affordable um, housing strategy and a more sustainable um, kind of game plan where you, where you not only out for the exit. Right. So in this market, um, it's an interesting real estate market. Um, the, the third type of deal I wanted to talk about was your house which now is complete. Um, first of all, with interest rates going up, prices of housing is coming down, but not significantly. It's, it's not as affordable as per se it was just a few years ago to get a house. One of the ways to get into a house, as you've done, is find something in the area you want and then make it what you want through renovations and construction. To much or as little as you want to explain, I'm very curious if you can explain in my terms how do you do that you obviously got to find the home but what goes into finding a home renovating a home refining a home like wh what are the steps you look for that you did because your house turned out great yeah i guess in the in first step again is putting in the groundwork which doesn't require too much of uh, of a skill or education right i mean i i just knew that area at Ganey Ranch, McCormick Park. It's just an area that I just... You just picked an area where you wanted to live and yeah. then you started honing it on it. That's, that's one thing, but I've always, I've always enjoyed that area, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a member at the golf club there. Patrick lives there. It's close to Paradise Valley. I, 
you know, there's just so many reasons why I truly believe that that is a not only a good area as far as a value proposition, but also for me personally. Yeah, it's just I just I just love it there. So I I've always, at some point, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna buy something for myself, then I want to be in that area. Mm-hmm. And coincidentally enough, Patrick thought the same way about that particular area. I mean, usually we both like the same stuff. Um, and we found his house first and did his house. And then after everything was done, it turned out amazing. I said, okay, the next opportunity that pops up, you know, is, is going to be for me. And um, I mean, we kept an eye on this little pocket. We've always kept an eye on this pocket um, because we did, we actually did flips there too. Like we flipped the house in Ganey, um, flipped one in McCormick. Um, one of our partners, Jonathan, he lives around the corner. I have two friends that live there. I mean, it's just, we just like that area. So just like I told you when we bought your house, you just, you want to be in a position where you're ready to pull the trigger, but you really don't have to, right? I had a, my living situation was fine. I had an apartment, yep. totally worked out for me, but I knew at some point when I find something, I'm going to pull the trigger and that's exactly what happened. And in this case, it was a text message I got in the morning from Valerie with a picture of outside of her front door and a sign going up across the street. So I looked at them and I didn't find anything. I talked to Patrick. It's like, this thing's going on the market. We've got to talk to these agents. We didn't know the agents, but it didn't matter. So um, initially, um, because we're not disclosing the address, I can say that one of the biggest problems with agents that we had ourselves, before we weren't agents, they sometimes have apparently a hard time to pick up their phone, return a call, or text message. That was the same case with that particular agent, it was just a nightmare to get a hold of them. Yeah, um, it, was, it was actually two agents. Anyways, got a hold of them same day, and I said, "Listen, we know the owner too because it was an older lady during construction of Patrick's house. We chatted with her a couple of times. You know, neighbors are just interested, and I happened to be there a few times, talked to her. Patrick talked to her. She knew Valerie. She knew Leo. So there was already like a little bit of a report. However, we didn't know that they were planning this. The sign just popped up, mm-hmm. and then it turns out that there was a family relationship." between the agent and, and the seller. Long story short, got the agent on the phone and said, listen, what do we do? What do we need to do to get this done today? I want the house. Yep. It's going to be did, my personal house. You did and kind of like everything you shouldn't do. Everything <laughs> you shouldn't do when you want to go- get a good deal. <laughs> I did. You so wearing your heart on your sleeve. I, wor- I, I, I do. But um, again, I... That's what I did in that moment. And I was like, if this house is meant to be for me, then um, it's going to happen. And again, the seller remembered all of us. I said, this is personal home for me. There's no intent to to, to sell it for profit, which obviously it's technically none of anyone's business, right? What I do with right. the property once I secure the contract. But I just wanted to make sure that this, again, goes back to what we said in the beginning. Right out of the gates, I didn't know the agent, but within two minutes, I mean, she knew I was probably as genuine as they come, at least in a first phone call. Mm -hmm. So we secured the property same night, full ask. Um, I said, I'm going to take the house as is. I'm not going to ask for repairs. I'll put it in the contract. Done deal. Yep. So, um, and then it came on the market next day as pending. I got a couple phone calls. People saying, dude, this could have been your house. And I said, we already got it. (laughs) So faster than you, faster than you, baby. So, so, um, how does it work? You, you find a house, you want to fix it up. Like, what are the steps? I, I presume you get a normal, like I'm, I'm asking questions more like you get a normal loan yeah. and then you get a construction loan or it's cash. Like walk yeah. them through the steps. People want to know. So we, I got a construction loan on that property, which is typically uh, what we do, whether it's a retail, um, deal or like an investment deal. That's typically what we do. Um, construction loan can be facilitated by through a bank or a portfolio loan, but it can also come from investors. Mm-hmm. In this case, we used um, one of the banks that we have a good relationship with that um, did the loan, loan for us. Um, shout out on that end to uh, Brent Nardekia from High Place Mortgage and Ryan Myers. Those, those are um, the guys that we do a lot of business with and they, um, they got it done again. Um, and this time for me personally, obviously, it's it's, it's a big deal uh, for me. So Brent and Ryan got us the deal, and then we had to come up with about 
$240,000 in cash. So typically, you have anywhere between 10 and 20% that you have to put down depending on what kind of loan you get, right? And in this, in this case, um, I had to come up with 20% for everything. That means they g- they're going to look at the purchase price, which was 750 I rolled my commission in to reduce the purchase price, so I have a low basis. And then we came up with a budget, which was about 400000 Um, And the loan amount I got was $921,500. That's the note I have on the property. So everything else, whether it's the portion on the down payment or any excess funds needed for... Um, any additional renovation that go outside of the agreed budget and scope um, needs to be cash. So that's pretty much th- that's pretty much the setup. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. But and, and then obviously uh, we don't need to go into the detail of flipping the house. By the way, guys, if it turned out phenomenal. First of all, um, but then now it's done. So now the house's value is worth more. So what does that now look like? You go back to the bank and refi, or like what do you do now at this point? Um, so the loan, the loan that we have is an interest-only loan, mm-hmm. um, and um, it's a it's a construction loan. So obviously, a construction loan is not like a permanent financing um, situation. So the way we do it is there is a couple of things on the on the tax side that are worth considering. So if you have a primary residence, and I'm I'm not a full disclosure, I'm not a tax consultant by trade, um, but I do know this for me from our CPA. Um, that up to a million dollars, you can million dollars in loan amount for your primary residence, you can write off the interest on your personal taxes. Um, so what we're gonna try to do, depending on how the interest interest environment is gonna develop, I'm gonna at some point try to max out on that end yep. um, and get the note up to a million. Um, I think if we would appraise the house right now, it's worth anywhere between, you know, one three five one four. Um, that's probably somewhat the value. Um, of it, so there is there is a good amount of equity in the home. Yeah. Um, um, which part of it is obviously cash, and the other one is part of the value that we that we increased by uh, pretty much gutting the entire place. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think something to consider too, which I I think is important for everyone when you look at buying your primary residence, um, is you know at some point to see what can this rent for, and yeah. we usually go through these scenarios. Um, pretty much before we close, right? Obviously, the project that um, you're invested in, that's not going to be a rental, right? Um, but whether it's multifamily or um, my primary residence, I want to know what can I rent this thing for, right? So, because at the end of the day, if you have a property in, in that good of a location, why would I sell it, right? right. So if I, can, if I can at some point move out cash flow positive, turn into an investment property, Mm-hmm. depreciate it, get the appreciation over time, have someone else pretty much paying it off depending on how I structure the note, right? Because right now it's an interest only mm-hmm. because of the tax advantages that we discussed, right? Which usually interest only, the rate is a little bit higher. But, you know, typically in the first like 10 years of, of a loan, 85% goes towards interest anyway. So there's a very small principle uh, that you're that you're kind of servicing over the first 10 years yeah. anyway. So... What I chose is I chose maximizing um, on what kind of what what I can actually deduct, right, on my taxes, but mainly because because the value is there, right. I don't I'm I'm not buying this for one four, right. I bought it for seven fifty minus commission at that time. I think I bought it like for seven thirty, but we also went through six months of, you know, I wouldn't say hell, but it was definitely outside of all the other projects that we're doing and everything else, it was definitely a lot. But we we got it done. So that's why this play works. Yeah, it's amazing. Is there a time constriction? There's a, Is there a time limit of interest only? Like you can only do it for so long? That depends on... It depends on the deal that you have with the bank. Mm-hmm. It depends on whether it's a construction note or not a note or, or a non-construction note. Um, we recently refied... Um, also through um, Brent and Ryan, an investment loan um, where we have a construction of perm note. So that one is a little bit more complex, but what it pretty much means is you get additional construction funds to finish the construction on the property. We're taking out the inv- initial investment loan because it was like 3% more expensive than what we actually pay now. Mm-hmm. So 
But then once the construction is completed, the node automatically transfers into a permanent node. Yep. And that permanent node is interest only too. And that one is, I think we have it for, I think if I recall right, it's like seven years. So there's different different types of products out there. Mm-hmm. So um, whoever gets involved in that, you just need, need to have an amazing lender and resources to understand all your options. Yeah. What was the, just side question, what was the like coolest part of doing this process on your own home? What, was it, what did you have most fun with? The housewarming. It's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good housewarming. It's pretty fun. We can leave that. We can, we can just leave it at that. No, I think <laughs> I think the what I enjoyed the most was to actually do the things I've always wanted to do for myself. Right. Yeah. I mean, everybody has their has their has their things that they wanted, and I've always dreamed of like having my own gym in oh, my man. house. It turned out good. Um, and I always knew. If and when I'm gonna do it, it's not gonna be just some half-assed, used, shitty equipment <laughs> in like a, you know, in like a room that's too small. So yeah. uh, to the sacrifice of one bedroom now, obviously, but uh, who needs four bedrooms <laughs> anyways? Yeah. Um, yeah. And as you know, we're both. I mean, Patrick, you and I, usually all of our close friends, we all uh, have a little bit of problem with shoes. And um, <laughs> and uh, not a problem. Uh, it's not a problem. Yeah, Patrick's behind the camera over there. He, he just raised his eyebrows. Not a problem. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> the thing is those things don't cash flow. I really can't make sense out of they it. They cash flow with joy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that uh, that uh, custom shoe wall that we did in the closet. Um, those are those are my highlights. But I mean, it's funny. I thought about this. Uh, thought about this yesterday. I think to be able to if you if you lived in an apartment. Pretty much the entire time, which I did since I was here, um, you know, there's not really a lot of hosting going on. Obviously, there's like a, you can hang at the community areas, and my apartment building is is, is actually really nice, uh, with a gym and all the good stuff too. But like, it's just a different feeling to have someone come over to your house, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, to see people enjoying themselves, being able to host them, and uh, you know, call it a home. And actually have now a lot of space, right? I mean, from 740 square feet to almost 2,900 square feet yep. is, uh, is quite the jump. And um, I think the last thing I've always wanted is I wanted to have an office at home, full setup, just like I have it here with four screens, printer, everything I need, um, you know, to, to, just be, to just be extremely productive. Yep. You got it all now dialed in, as you would say. Now it's done. You know, what's interesting, guys, is... is um, he sent me, you sent me the a PDF of every, fin- everything, from every handle to the spec on the toilet, which, by the way, the toilet's ridiculous. Heats your butt. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Shout uh, out to Toto. <laughs> that is a heck of a toilet. I mean, everything, every finish, everything. I mean, it's just so cool how dialed in you have that packet. Like, yeah. Like that's, that's, that's just from years of experience of flipping houses, you know, exactly what you need. Yeah. But, uh, I do have to say without, uh, without Laura and Patrick, this is impossible. I mean, the, the yeah. magicians behind the scenes, uh, are both of them, uh, not only putting it, putting it together the way you see it, where literally anything you point out in my house, I mean, we have the link, we have the price, we have everything. I mean, we, it's all, it's all put together, uh, which is also something that the bank, uh, enjoyed obviously knowing that we, you know, know what we're doing here um gives them gives them a lot of ease but yeah patrick and laura absolutely killed it um i think it has the house is truly special it's my first house and as you know my family is in town now uh, to be able to share that um with them yeah. and my closest friends is, is something that has that has no price tag so it's amazing um, well congrats on that thank you um all right rounding it out so 2023 where do you see the real estate market going shaking up what way? How do you how do you position yourself for success in in your shoes? So we've already seen um, prices compressing, right? Um, now we obviously got to look at which price points are we talking here. I think in the sub two million price market, um, depending on the areas, you see anywhere between ten to fifteen percent. We've seen inventory go almost back to normal levels, right? I mean, we used to have about nine thousand listings. 
and now we're like uh, closer to 20,000 plus. So that's doubled, which is good for buyers, right? Because now there's more options. Uh, puts a lot of more pressures on the sellers. Um, but out of an investment standpoint, especially in the multifamily space, um, we have been starting to see opportunities um, mostly in the value add space where that's the space that we enjoy, right? The more work we can put in, the better. Um, on the luxury side, um, that market is a little bit, let's say, isolated and kind of different than the rest because the supply is still not that high, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you go very granularly. You look at 7 million, 6, 7 million up, modern, all new, or remodeled. There's only so much coming. I mean, th there's our projects. There's a couple of guys in town that do what we do, but it's it's not like a flood of inventory. At the same time, demand, whether it's local demand, people, you know, relocating from, you know, more, more, more up north in the um, DC range, Silver Leaf area down to Paradise Valley, Canadian buyers. Uh, we got buyers from California. We got buyers from Texas. We got buyers from New York. I think that the demand um, is still good. Yeah. Um, I think on the acquisition side, it's just, just very tough. Because the market is so isolated and so strong, you know, it's not like you see these like highly discounted uh, properties on the acquisition side. You know, there's just not not a lot of distress and dirt. Um, I mean, acre lots under two million in, in like in like prime areas in PV are pretty much, you know, you pretty much don't find them, right? I mentioned we bought that one four just a little over one four, um, like one one and a half years ago. You know that that same lot today you'd probably pay two, and again with you gotta make you you make the money on the buy for sure, um, so now you're pushing a higher exit price. So it's 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 gonna be tough. At the same time, uh, we have started to look at Florida, where this has been in the works two years plus. Um, I'm licensed there now. There's gonna be a cool announcement here soon. I'm actually flying to Miami tonight, as you know, for like a quick two day business trip there. We have our project going, so we will probably uh, we will still focus on on luxury, but we want to wrap our projects up. I don't think we're going to really f find so many more new projects this year um, yep. on that end. Um, obviously, we're looking at Florida and then multifamily. That's where um, our acquisition focus um, will be because uh, we got to obviously reposition um, and redeploy the capital that comes out of the projects that we're wrapping up. Um, and we just want to make sure that we have you know, a variety of options for investors like you and ourselves. Um, because if you're too hyper-focused on a market like PV now and you're expecting to exit out of, you know, six projects and have the next deal already lined up, that's just not, not going to happen. Um, you know, but that's, we understand that. We already saw that kind of coming on that end a little over a year ago um, as prices started to increase, supply has been, you know, I wouldn't say stagnant, but everything that's coming new on the market. You know, there's a lot of older homes coming on the market um, in PV, but it's not that newly dialed in product that now you see left and right and you're competing with 10 other $7 million homes that are right. moving ready. Yep. It's an interesting market, man. Um, first of all, thanks for coming uh, and joining the pod and having me in here. Yeah, thank you um, for coming. You came to my office, bro. Yeah, this is... This is good little setup. I like the couch. <laughs> uh, host some others. Um, in the in the description, guys, you'll be able to find Max and, and all of his information from Instagram. To you, you guys are getting rolling on YouTube. Yeah, shout out to the boys. Hopefully, you don't have any. I mean, like, hopefully, you have a good videographer that doesn't like lose SD cards, stuff like that. Yeah, weird, heard, weird stuff I happens. Heard, I heard other people are struggling with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. And there's also like they have problems with being on time. I don't know what it is. There's like different <laughs> different time zones. Uh, I mean, uh, forget cameras at podcasts. Like interesting things, man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We're getting flipped off behind the camera. <laughs> Inside jokes, guys. Anyway, all jokes aside, thanks for coming again. Thanks for watching, guys. Click that like button. Click subscribe, and we will see you guys on the next video.